Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and tonight my guest is Dale Kazmarek. We actually met at Haunted Road Media Paracon in 20, let's see, this is 2020, so it would have been 2018. And uh, I found his books to be interesting. I don't have any, I'm sorry. But um, I did, I was just telling him off air that I had seen his name prior to uh, meeting him in a book that I have it, had here at home called Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places. So I was excited to meet him. And he he's also friends with our friends at McPike Mansion. And he's done all kinds of things all over Chicago. And he has six books. And a few of them are on haunted places in Chicago. And he has been asked to do things on the Discovery Channel as a consultant, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. And he's appeared on multiple TV shows. One recently was Most Terrifying Places. Is that correct? Number seven, correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. And like I said, I missed it when it came on. Was that a, a new one or was that an old old one that was a repeat? It's an old one to repeat. The most recent one I was on was one called Paranormal Survivor. And I, and I watch that um, sometimes because my friend Linda Carino is one of their paranormal quote unquote experts. That's what she says. She says, I'm not an expert. <laughs> but, um, but she is one of the, the experts on that show. And another friend of mine was in the first season as uh, one of the experts. And that was um, Joe Citrone. Him and I are really close friends. We actually filmed a movie together. So um, I like the show. I just sometimes get bored with reenactment shows. Yeah. I, I don't. So when you were on that show, the, the Paranormal Survivor, what was your story? Well, I was uh, involved with a case out in Oswego, Illinois, of a uh, woman who had... Uh, all kind of paranormal phenomena going inside her home. Um, she believed it was her mother, who at that uh, she had known all her life and was a very bad person. She was a pedophile. She was an alcoholic. She was a drug abuser. And uh, she wasn't very nice at all. In fact, I met her one time when we were doing an investigation out when she was living out in Bolingbrook, Illinois. And uh, she was having problems even then. And then when her mother passed away, um, she really believed her mom was uh, coming back to haunt her because they did not get along very well. It got to the point where uh, she was literally displaced from her room upstairs in her bedroom, and they were both sleeping. Her and her husband were both sleeping on the uh, studio couch in the uh, living room. 
her husband wasn't much of a believer. He he had a few instances that happened to him, but it seemed to all be surrounding uh, Anita. I, can, I could use her name because she was used on the show, Anita Spiro. And um, some of the interesting stories that really happened there, and one one in particular, uh, she had she does a lot of uh, antique work, but she refurbishes stuff and makes kind of old stuff new again mm-hmm. uh, and new stuff old again, uh, basically. And um, she had this one client that would come over and pick up stuff all the time. And she said, if I'm never not around and the door's open, just yell that you're here and you know, I'll come upstairs because I'm usually down in the basement working. So she came in one day and she said, Anita, I'm here. She said, I'm upstairs. I'll, I'll be right down. She, she decided to go up and meet her up up the stairs. And then, of course, all of a sudden, Anita comes out of the basement. And Anita goes, what are you doing up there? He goes, well, somebody just called me to go upstairs. And he goes, there's nobody home but me. And this woman got white as a ghost, literally, to coin a term, left, never came back, did not return any phone calls, emails, or anything else. Now, we have been there multiple times investigating, and we had a lot of experiences going on there, including footsteps, um, things that were happening in her room. Uh, We were doing a live EVP session when uh, we had about about a half a dozen people in the room sitting around with cameras, tape recorders, equipment, and uh, her mother had actually perished in a fire. Uh, she had, uh, I guess she fell asleep with a cigarette, started the place on fire, uh, died from smoke inhalation and, 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 and burns with her body. And uh, so we were asking questions. And one of the questions that came up, because we knew the story, we knew the history uh, about her dying in a fire. We said, did you die in a fire? And all of a sudden you hear this disembodied voice that comes through and it goes, And right away, everybody looks around and goes, what the heck was that? Um, We had a rookie uh, paranormal investigator with us on on their very first investigation. We were trying her out. And she goes, right away, it's got to be the cat. There is no cat here. And then we asked a follow-up question, is that you? And it did the same thing. It was coming out of the, like, it was kind of a, the master bedroom connected with a master bath. And it was coming out of the bathroom. Uh, Later on that evening, we were doing an EVP session, or two of us, uh, two, uh, two of our female investigators were upstairs sitting on the floor in the bathroom doing an EVP session. We actually had cameras all throughout the house, and we actually saw them sitting on the floor. So we knew they were not moving around. All of a sudden, all three or four of us were in the, by the command center watching the monitors, and we see this like a chorus of uh, footsteps little pitter-patter of footsteps run across the upstairs from one side to the other. And we all look up. We look at them. They're sitting down. Everybody is accounted for. We couldn't figure it out. Uh, so we had a lot of strange things going on in that home. Um, unfortunately, when they did the reenactment, they didn't use any of the actual EVPs that we picked up, which I thought was really a shame. Mm-hmm. Because we really had some great stuff that we could have showed them. Uh, they kind of recreated what we said happened there and what we picked up. And of course they had to, the, the, the guy they selected to, to, to play me, uh, it was a middle-aged guy with a bald head. It looks, looks nothing like me. <laughs> Cause I don't have, oh. I got hair on my head. Um, so they got somebody on staff to be you, huh? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But it's it's a very interesting case. It's an ongoing case. I mean, we've been there a couple of times, and she calls us every now and then when things begin to happen again. Um, She's been in the bedroom where a bathroom when she's there by herself, and she'll actually look underneath the door, and she'll see like a shadow going underneath the bottom of the door. She'll try to open the door to get out to see what's, you know, in the home because she's by herself, and she can't get out of the bathroom. The, the door's locked, and there's no lock on the door. And uh, that's kind of crazy, too. I mean, uh, uh, the the animals reacted funny. We actually had a camera that was placed on a tripod in a room just monitoring one of the bedrooms. You know, these cameras are, are locked down. They're tightened. Now, every, every now and then, you, you expect maybe a camera to become a little bit loose, and the camera might kind of go down a little bit and kind of, you know, go down towards the ground. You can expect that. But then we we were watching the camera. When it went down, then the camera went back up. 
Now, that's defying the laws of gravity. Mm -hmm. The camera going down, but not correcting going back up. And that was an amazing piece of what we call equipment equipment manipulation. Mm -hmm. I can't even say that. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Kind of tongue ties me myself. But uh, it was really amazing because uh, of all the time I've been doing these investigations, I think I've only had that happen two other times. So it's really not the norm for that to happen because there has to be some physical force exerted on the camera to push it down and then to push it back up. It's just as simple as that. Yeah, of course, especially up. Yes. Gravity works great going down. It just doesn't work that good going up. Yeah. So, (laughs) well, I I mean, just physics, I guess. But yeah, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've seen so many stories on Paranormal Survivor. Some of them are, fan, you know, too fantastic. Yeah, where yeah. you sit there and you go, "There, how in the heck did that happen?" Or, you know, are they playing it up? Mm-hmm. You know, because you know they do get to do some creative editing. Yeah. On, on your stories, because once you sign your name on that dotted line, it's their story. Mm-hmm. And what they do with the reenactment has nothing to do with you. You know, that's that's the one good thing. The reenactment part has nothing to do with you. They've already gotten everything from you, more than likely, from the stu- from the studio soundstage when you di- when you did all the filming. And so, um, like I said I know enough to be dangerous on this from talking to to Linda and and Joe and, and all these other people on how this is done. But I get, I bet you've gotten to meet a lot of interesting people doing paranormal survivor and other, other shows. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've actually met Dan Aykroyd. Uh, we were, uh, I was flown out to, uh, uh, New York city one, one year, uh, to be part of a, uh, a new show that Dan Aykroyd was going to be filming called way out. Mm-hmm. And it was going to be about not just ghosts. It was all kind of paranormal, psychic stuff, UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, you know, lake monsters, all kind of just way out stuff. Yeah. And uh, they shot about 12 episodes. And I got the chance to beat Dan Aykroyd and Mr. Ghostbuster. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> got, a, got a picture taken with him. And uh, uh, we later found out that uh, <clears throat> they decided to scrap the entire show. Uh, which is kind of kind of sad because I was going to be the premiere episode here, and uh, I guess me and Dan really kind of kicked it off really nice because uh, you know his big forte was you know Ghostbusters. You know he mm-hmm. was, he was ghost hunting, and uh, in real life he's into ghost hunting. I mean, right. I, there was a book written by Peter Ackroyd, uh where I'm, where I have a prominent mention in it as well, and I was uh, thumbing through a bookstore. Uh, one one afternoon, I think it was a, a Barnes and Noble or something like that, and uh, I always go to the occult section to find out what, you know what new books are available and what my, oh, yeah. I can add to my library, which is quite extensive already. Um, and I found this book there, and I'm looking. Oh, Peter Ackroyd, oh, and it's it's related to Dan Ackroyd. So I mean, uh, they're the Ackroyds, and I'm looking through the book, and I'm thumbing through, and all of a sudden I see my name, and there I go, wow. They mentioned me, so that was pretty cool. And this was after I had met him, so I think that a lot had that had a lot to do with it because we hit off so well with the interview. We talked so much before and after, and then he said, "If, if, if he's ever in Chicago, uh, he's going to invite me over to House of Blues to be a, you know, to be his guest uh, in his uh, his personal booth." Uh, it, was, it never happened, but <laughs> I thought it might be. A, it was interesting if it ever did. Oh yeah, I bet. Um, boy, but he's, I, uh, I, he's got I, a lot of books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I've met a lot of other people. I, the only person I did not meet was Hans Holzer, but I've met Brad Steiger. I mean, I've met, uh, um, you know, John Keel, the guy that met the, uh, wrote the Mothman Prophecies. I, I, uh, I have all his books, and they're very, very hard to come by. Um, I've met a lot of interesting people. Um, in the paranormal that the fact that I met uh, Josh Gates from destination America. I, I met John Zaffis from the paranormal collector, uh, Dave Schrader, uh, you know, just, you know, the list goes on of all these people that I've met, you know, in the course of my works or meeting them at conferences or whatever, and uh, later becoming great friends with them. So far, I can say I haven't met too many famous people. Um, Parafamous, yeah, I've met a few. Yeah. 
Um, mm-hmm. And through the show, some of the people now have TV are on TV, you know, and often they weren't when I met them, but they are now. So it's kind of kind of neat to watch their careers blossom. And I can say I talked to them before, which I I always find fun. And uh, my daughter has uh, she read a book about that Josh Gates wrote, and she just she loves him, and so does my granddaughter, who's three. She knows who Josh Gates is, but she also knows um, all the ghost hunting shows, especially the one mommy grandma was on. She she sees that and she she just points and says, <laughs> "That's my grandma." Yeah. And so so that was fun. But um, we do have a question in chat for you. I don't know if you can answer this in in five minutes. But the okay. question is from Tom McNicholas. Dale, are you sometimes afraid to go into a stranger's home to do an investigation? What do you ask before you go into a private home? Well, of course, you always have to be careful going into anyone's private home. We don't, I don't, never do that by myself anyway. I always bring my team along with me. Uh, so what I normally do is I interview people over the phone, try to get the relevant information of what's going on to kind of give me an idea of what to expect once we get there. Not Not always what what they say is what what you get because a lot of times we went to places where the unexpected would happen where things would just totally off the wall would happen happened during tv uh, uh, live tv shows and and, and tape tv shows for the discovery channel and other episodes uh um so once we get all the information together pretty much we can bring our team in and bring i te- when i say bring my team in i bring them in ice cold in other words i don't tell them what's going on they have no idea what's what's happening except they're going to a house that's allegedly haunted. I think that's the most scientific way of doing it because there's, that way they have no preconceived notions of what's going on. Uh, now, unlike the TV shows you see on TV where they're always told in advance, this is the room where all the activity takes place. So everybody flourishes to that room right away. You know, you know my my you know you know my team goes throughout the house with with equipment. You know. Uh, trying to get baseline readings, trying to figure out what's going on. Sometimes, uh, most often with uh, uh, you know, floor plans, we then go, go back in phase two. And before the client tells us what's going on or the, the team, our team tells the client what they've experienced to see how that matches. And very often it matches quite nicely. Of course, in phase three, we would set up equipment, cameras, tape recorders, do EVP sessions, other experiments throughout the evening. But uh, it's always, uh, you always never know quite what you're getting involved with. Uh, I would never, uh, you know, I would always tell people never to go to a location anywhere by yourself. I don't care if it's uh, in the downtown city or if it's out in the middle of the, the boondocks. I mean, it's just safety's sake. You always got to go with the team, with other with other people. Yeah, I agree. You don't go anywhere alone. Because you don't know what kind of crazy you might be walking into. Absolutely. Because, I mean, I'm not saying that people who see spirits are crazy, but there could be something else going on there. And in this day and age, we just can't trust everybody blindly. Oh, absolutely. Uh, It's a completely different environment than when I grew up uh, uh, in the 1950s. uh, uh, When you could walk down the street at 1030 at night and not be scared of being snatched uh, you can't do that today. <laughs> no, you can't. So, I mean, I lived in Baltimore City, and I was mugged when I was nine. Oh, wow. For change. I mean, mm-hmm. that's – so, you know, you would think that I would be scared to walk around places by myself, but no, nope, not. And in fact, I tend to walk around like I'm in charge. Mm-hmm. I I had to I had to learn how to do that in my life is just walk around like and I have to pay attention to everything that's around and because of that I see stuff other people don't see and okay. sometimes sometimes I don't see I don't, don't see what everybody else is seeing because I see other things it's just it's kind of weird but um I don't know it's it's one of those weird things but everybody will be back with Dale in just a few In just a few minutes, you're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Please make sure that you send me your questions, and we will get get those asked and answered. And we have all kinds of fun stuff to talk about with Dale when we get back. Thank you.
You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcast. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and my guest tonight is Dale Kaczmarek. And before we go any further, I have another question that has popped up in front of me. And this is from Carl from Caldwell County Paranormal out of Caldwell County, Missouri. He asks, what type of equipment does your team use and what is your favorite? Well, um, I have over $14,000 worth of equipment um, that I've stockpiled uh, since the last um, 20, 30 years here. Um, uh, I can't say what my favorite is, but I'll tell you there are there are, there are some new stuff that I'm working on right now. One is called the, uh, a, uh, a, a, it's a laser grid called the GS2. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. I just purchased one here recently. Uh, it not only shows the laser grid, you know, the actual grid on, on the, the surface, but if something passes in front of it, there's a small screen that actually shows you the configuration of what just passed through. I think I saw that on TV recently. And I'm I'm waiting to to uh, for our first investigations to show up. Of course, here in Chicago, we have to wait a little longer because of the weather. It's so so brutal out here. And uh, but you know, some of my f- favorite equipment would be like as far as the EMF, EMF meter would be the Trifield Natural EMF EMF meter, uh, which basically does not pick up internal AC fields. Uh, so that's when you go into a location, you're it's guaranteed you're not going to pick up. You know, electrical outlets, uh, electrical surging through there, uh, stuff given off by, um, um, say, fluorescent lighting or anything like that. So if it does go off, and it very rarely goes off, uh, you usually got something. Because that's why you hardly ever see it used in these paranormal shows on TV, because it never goes off. I mean, these paranormal shows like to have things always going off all the time. Uh, bells and whistles and everything like that, which is fine. I mean, but 
what are you actually picking up with that equipment? You're picking up a wide range of EMF, which may not necessarily be paranormal. Um, I have a, um, uh, another one of my favorite devices. I guess it's, it's actually an application uh, that we use. is called the Phasma Box. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Phasma Box, but I tell you, we have gotten just some amazing results from that device. It uses internet radio and sound banks. Uh, along with the reverb and echo effect. And the idea is that the spirits are able to manipulate that and form words and answer questions. And we've had direct full sentences come out in response to our questions. Uh, There's several examples on my my website, uh, ghostresearch.org, that people can go to and check out the the haunted section of different locations we've investigated. Uh, check out McConaughey Cemetery and Elgin Casket Factory for two. Um, give you a quick example with the Elgin Casket Factory in Elgin, Illinois. Uh, it was kind of dressed up around Halloween for people to be scared, to get the, the Jesus scared out of them pretty much. <laughs> and uh, But it was really an, a, a real casket factory at one time. They used to build seal caskets. And... Um, they have a lot of different decorations. In fact, there was a, a fuse box that was there for effect. It was not even connected. It didn't work. Anything like that. We were using uh, one, another one of my favorite devices, which is called the XCAM Structured Light Sensor Device. It's where uh, it produces a, a series of dots invisible to the naked eye. Something comes into that, it'll show up like a stick figure. Um, there's been many, uh, m- many different groups have kind of uh, uh, made these different types of devices from the Connect system. I used the one from Digital Dowsing. And one of my researchers was holding that, and suddenly a stick figure appeared next to this electrical box. So I immediately said, well, if you're next to the electrical box, throw one of those switches, turn it on, show us that it works. There was a brief pause. A voice comes through and it says, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh. uh, when, you get, when you get something like that, I mean, that's, that's just pretty amazing. In McConaughey Cemetery, we were out there investigating a cemetery that had no, just had a sign, no gravestones, didn't even know how many people were buried there. And we asked the question, how many people are buried here? There was a voice that came through that said, more than 100 so when you're getting direct responses like that, I mean, I've always kind of poo-pooed the idea of these applications because they they really, especially the applications that say you can use your phone as an EMF meter. Well, you, obviously your phone has no sensors that would pick up EMF. Uh, but the voices that are generated through these devices, whatever – uh, technology that are using, whether it's internet radio, whether it's algorithms or something else, you know, those are interesting because sometimes those act- those words that are generated, uh, whether it be the obelisk, whether it be, you know, actual ghost applications, very often answer questions in many times in full sentences, which are just amazing. It, I have witnessed the Phasma box. At Mineral Springs. So I I get the full sentence thing because um, we saw it in action on the the ball, you know, near the ballroom down there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the only difference, you know, there's a lot of different um, ITC devices. And the, th- the difference with uh, the Phasma box over some of the others is you have to have a Windows tablet or a PC, a Windows PC to use it. That's the only thing, and it's not expensive at all. Um, do you use a lot of ITC devices, bes- you know, besides the Phasma box? Uh, we use uh, the Obelisk X, uh, the Obelisk PX. Uh, we also use um, the uh, – um, I use one called the uh, Radio Spectre uh, that was actually designed by Andrew Oppenlander. Yep, I know, um, Andrew. And also another one uh, called the SB7, which we actually connect to what's called a mini portal. Uh, the mini portal using an SB7 or an SB11 or any spirit box for that matter will actually take that when you're scanning, you hear that. Mm-hmm. It, takes, it takes that scanning off and all you hear is the voices that come through. See, is, I, I hate the white noise in there. Yeah. 
It irritates the life out of me, gives me a headache, and says, done. I'm done with this. Um, and, and, the, and the thing with the white noise, too, basically, I mean, it actually sometimes helps spirits to use that white noise as a background or medium for their voices. But in, when you're recording and you're asking questions, if you have a very low, subtle voice, that scanning is going to just completely obliterate that, and you won't even hear what is being said. So we, we, we use that. We use the, 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 the SB7, uh, the, the SB11. The SB11 I like because it actually allows you to disconnect from the radio. Uh, so you can disconnect from the radio antenna. So in theory, you're not picking up any radio frequency unless you're cl- close to a very strong signal like 50,000 watts you know, nearby. Then you still might get some little bit of radio bleed over. But the very first time I used that, was in a place called Paris Hospital in Paris, Illinois. We went down with another group called Jason Snyder and Crawford County Ghost Hunters Group. Um, and we go down there every year, uh, spend like three or four days with these guys. They're great. And uh, the very first time I used that, we were in a, an operating suite. And we, we just said, can you yell out? Can you say hello? Yell out real loud. And sure enough, right after that, female voice came out and said hello. And uh-huh. nearly knocked, knocked my stock off the very first time we used it. It's so, funny you shouldn't mention Crawford County because they, they just spent the night at McPike Mansion over the weekend. Absolutely. And uh, I, was, I, I was going to be down there myself with them and join them. Unfortunately, the weather between here and Alton was not so great. And I wasn't going to take my new car all the way down there in that slush mm. and sleet and snow mm-hmm. and ice. Uh, so I just kind of uh, you know, just bowed out, but I watched them live. They had a live Facebook uh, 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 video that they were shooting the entire time, and I was interacting with them. Uh, they actually had some interesting things happen there. They actually had a door open and then a door closed. Now, it was windy out that night, so I can see maybe the door being pushed open, but not being pulled back out and slamming, literally slamming. Which door was it? The front door. The front oh, the door. front door. The that front door's door. heavy. It is very heavy. Um, I don't know if you have you been there since they put the new doors on or the the old doors back on. No, uh, I, yeah, we were, we were there about three or four times, uh, mostly in the 1990s and early 2000s. Yeah, those doors are extremely heavy. Yeah. Um, I know from experience by <laughs> opening them and shutting them all the time. So. Um, I had I got a concussion when I was there the last time, but not from that door. It was from the basement door. Mm, so yeah. whole other problem. And uh, I had just had somebody else at, say, wasn't Crawford County j- just at McPike? And it's like, yeah, that's that's what yeah. I was saying. Yeah. So um, I haven't watched any of the videos. I guess I get I get irritated sometimes at watching other people investigate places that I know. Mm-hmm. You know because it's like. You didn't listen to the history, you know, or didn't you do some homework before you went? So I don't yeah. know what they did. So I have no feedback for them. But uh, since I give the the tours there and stuff, I just when I was doing the Sally House, I couldn't watch either. Right. And I was the tour guide there because they would always screw up, screw it up and go, Sally, are you here? And, so there's, and I'd get all mad and go, there's no damn Sally. Stop it. Right. <laughs> you know? And uh, so it's just one of those things that I just can't watch those videos. And if it's someplace I've never been, I won't watch anything at all because I don't well, want to know. Well, well, two points here. Number one, when talking about the McPike Mansion, I mean, uh, um, Jason had been down there, I think, once before with his group, I believe, a lot of many years ago. And uh, he, he asked me if I could help him with some of the history and hauntings. Because I, 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 I've been going back there off and on for um, you know, umpteen years. A very good friend with uh, the owners. Um, and uh, I used to go down there with uh, – I was part of the AGS conference down there in Alton as well, giving conferences or workshops. Uh, so I, I did help them with a lot with the history and the haunting. So they had a really well background information before they got there, and they did some other research on their own. They're very good as far as researching and investigating themselves. And the other point you bring up about the Sally House, which is something that a lot of people don't will never know, uh, I was actually the very first investigator actually brought in or at least invited to come to the Sally House by Craig Armstrong, who was a producer from the t- uh, TV show Sightings. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I did two other episodes with them, including one out in, in Gettysburg, and we were, we were the first team to actually be out there legally at night with park ranger to do an investigation. It was awesome. But we did this invest. We were, we were going to do the Sally House investigation. Unfortunately, I had just got off, got out of the hospital for you know, surgery on my shoulder uh, just about uh, three days uh, after they called. And I said, there's no way I could go. I can't carry suitcases. I can't even go through the, uh, the, the you know, the airport. Can you, can you, I even asked him, can you wait another week? And I was, no, no, I can't. You got to do it right now. Mm-hmm. It's always right now. So but... unfortunately, I, I gave him you know, my research assistant, who at that time was Howard Hine, and uh, he was the first one to go in there along with the with the production crew. Um, I have just recently went back to the Sally House, and finally in 2019, just this last year, uh, in uh, July. Um, so was, that was my very first time to to investigate the Sally House. So we did get a few things there, but not as loud. It wasn't as uh, I. Don't think it was quite as active as it was when the picnic. I, I can tell you why it's not as active, but I cannot tell you that on the air. Um, it has to do with a movie called The Deep Darkness that okay. is still being worked on, but um, it's a long story, and I know everybody wants to hear it. And as soon as I can tell them, I will. But um, it's one of those interesting um, places, and uh, just to let you know, management has changed up there and uh it be a little bit easier to get in and out of there um not having the control that they had but it's it's, it's a it, i have to say i have no desire to go back to the sally house since 2017 and like i said it's a long story and if you come to haunted road are you coming to the haunted road media paracon this year I'm not sure at this point. Uh, it depends on uh, on our schedule and what, what we got planned because uh, last year we did about 25 investigations, and that was just from uh, the beginning of um, uh, the end of, of February into uh, the beginning of October, and that was like almost every single weekend and sometimes packed uh, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays with investigations. So I, I know bet. this year. I know this year we're planning on going back to. A uh, number of places. Uh, we have a chance to investigate uh, Brushy Mountain uh, Prison, uh, Stones River Battlefield, with a, mm-hmm. a park ranger and uh, a police officer that had an encounter out there. Uh, also, uh, possibly going back to Old South Pittsburgh Hospital again. We're going to be going back to Gettysburg. Uh, we have a trip planned, possibly to Pennhurst. So um, it really depends what we and dozens of other places that we're looking at right now all over the country. Uh, possibly even going out to uh, um, uh, I've never been out to to the Velixa Axe House Velixa or... Axe Murder House yeah mm-hmm. I have some information on that for you too just to give you some heads up about the area sure. my husband's great uncle was the sheriff in that investigation okay and we live near the Axe Murder House that was four days before that in Paola, Kansas okay mm. See, nobody's been in that house except for people who have been renting, and it's right. been empty for a little while now. So, um, because they they claimed at one time that that house burned down in Paola, and I did some research and found out no, nah, that's not true. <laughs> okay, but there are signs all around it that say no trespassing and things like that. Um, and it's even smaller than the Velisca Axe Murder House, and the Velisca Axe Murder House is uh, smaller than the Sally House, which is twelve hundred square feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and when Martha says says that you can have like six people there, that's really all you can have in there without yeah. walking on top of each other. It's just we go. Um, we won't be going during day tours anymore, but uh, we've been multiple times. So I think you'll enjoy it. So, um, so are the is that the Velisca Axe Murder House one of your bucket list places? Uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, we we went to uh, several years ago. We went to Farrar School, mm-hmm. and I thought that was a very neat place. And uh, uh, we came back from the this this trip that we did to Kansas. We went out and, like I said, we did Sally House. We did McIntyre Villa, mm-hmm. um, and we also I were, can tell you stuff about that too. Yeah. We had a great time in McIntyre Villa. We actually got in the place for free. We actually were able to investigate the place called the Hardware Store in Atkinson. Mm-hmm. Um, Atchison. Atchison, yeah. Yes. 
Zach Baggins kept doing that, calling it Atkinson. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah I, know. I was the I was actually the tour guide for the, I did the trolley tours as well. So, like I said, I can tell you stuff about whole town. I can tell you which stories aren't true and which ones are, and it's it's an amazing, unusual place. If mm-hmm. you could have gotten into the the college Benedictine, that would have been amazing. Yeah. But yeah, I have. Uh, let's see, we were volunteers up there for ten years or seven years, so I know it well. Did um, Brushy Mountain? We were just driving through. Um, we stopped at a rest area and happened to see a sign about that. And I say, like, all these years we've been driving through here. This is the first time we see this. This was back in uh, in October when we were going through. And it was right after I had got my concussion at McPike. We thought we were going home instead of finishing our vacation. And I had told my husband, I said, nope, we're still going to go. Let's let's just go. And we stopped at some rest area, and there was this big sign about Brushy Mountain. And then all of a sudden, we saw it on TV. It was like, okay, well, that's interesting. And uh, so we we're thinking about checking that place out, too. And uh, we're hoping to go back to Gettysburg. So uh, I haven't been to Farrar, but if you go to Villisca Axe Murder House, just 30 minutes down the road, not maybe not even that, the, uh, oh, what is it, uh, Malvern Manor okay. is one that you should check out and because there's a connection between the Villisca Axe Murder House and Malvern Manor through Johnny Hauser. So somehow, some way, there's weird weird communication between those two houses according to johnny hauser so but it's like i said it's just right down the road you know you can get a day tour daytime investigation if you wanted to do Velisca at night so just keep that in mind so okay. but you know there's all kinds of different things but in that area there's even some other stuff not too far um north of of Velisca. so but When we come back from this next break, we're going to talk some more about, well, I got a question in chat we're going to ask you, but we're going to talk some more about your books and some other things that you guys have going on. Because so far, everything you've said is like, made me more, uh, more awake, finally. (laughs) I'm serious. I was really, I was yawning a lot earlier today on a meeting, so... But everybody, you're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. We'll be back with Dale Kazmarek in just a few minutes. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fake Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fake Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. 
Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and I'm talking with Dale Kazmarek. And we have been talking about so many things. Um, let's see. I am going to go back to this question. Um, the, the, the chat room brought up, how about Malvern Manor? Um, so let, let me make sure I didn't miss something here. Um, I don't want to be quiet. I want to talk to you, but I don't really want to miss miss out on any of the questions that are in the chat for you. Um, So when did you write your first book? My first book was written about uh, 1998. Uh, It was called Windy City Ghosts. Uh, followed up uh, pretty quickly with um, the one on spook lights uh, called Illuminating the Darkness to Mystery of Spook Lights, which is one of my passions besides Civil War battlefields, uh, looking at places where ghost lights or spook lights are, have been seen. Uh, I did a, a follow-up book to Windy City Ghost called Windy City Ghost 2. And then I did a couple of field guides, a field guide to spirit photography, field guide to uh, ghost hunting techniques, and then my latest book was a field guide to haunted highways and bridges, which is kind of our haunted infrastructure. Well, when you talk about spook lights, the first thing that comes up to me is the Joplin spook lights. Absolutely. I've and been there a, about a half a dozen times. A friend of ours did a movie on the spook lights in down in Joplin. His name is uh, David Glidden. And then he did a second movie that was about the spook lights, but then turned around and was about the crystal mine down in Mena, Arkansas. So somehow it, it changed, it changed while they were doing it. Um, so, um, I have never been, I've been to Joplin twice, maybe three times. I went after the tornado. Um, we don't live far from there, but it's out of the way. And so I've never been down to where the spook lights are, uh, but I've seen a lot about it. And then Kat does, you know, she, she knows about some of the spook lights, uh, the Brown mountain, Brown mountains. So how many places do spook lights occur? Well, I, if you read my book, you know, literally all across the country, uh, and you know, when I was writing the book on, uh, the ghost lights or spook lights, you know, I visited, uh, quite a number of these locations and investigated them places like uh, Joplin, Missouri. I was down there in uh, Labor Day weekend of 1982. That was the first time I was down there to investigate. And that's when we actually saw something really amazing, kind of like uh, a triangular uh, diamond shaped object, basically in the center of the field that was like sending off a glow, uh, giving off incandescent light. It was really quite amazing. And I'm thinking, is this what people have been seeing all the time? And it was, It was pretty amazing. I also had went out to investigate the Brown Mountain Lights back around 1984. Uh, The uh, there's 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 some kind of close to this area where I'm at. uh, uh, Somewhat close. There's a Waters Meet Ghost Light, often called the Paulding Light, up there in uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, which has actually been debunked. I actually was able to to debunk that quite nicely. It's simply car headlights and tail lights. Uh, much to the chagrin of those locals that wanted to keep their that <laughs> that haunt going because it attracted a lot of uh, people from out of state. Uh, I was down in Gurdon, Arkansas, to investigate the Gurdon, Arkansas ghost light with the Arkansas Gazette newspaper. Uh, we were out there in the middle of the night, and it was pretty amazing. I didn't see the light, but I actually had photographed it because I was using a 35 millimeter camera with a time lapse photography, and I was able to capture the lights uh, when I later later examined the film um went out to chapel hill north carolina a spook light that's out there uh one of the more famous ones is the mako light in north carolina joel uh sometimes called joe baldwin's light uh joe baldwin was a real life person that was allegedly decapitated as he was trying to uh ward off an oncoming train uh where part of his train had became unhitched and he was trying to flag him down with a lantern and he was allegedly decapitated. So people that see the light are actually seeing Joel Baldwin trying to flag down that 
that next train from coming. Well, they when I got there, it was really amazing. There was no train tracks left. I go, whoa, where's where's the train tracks? So uh, you can actually see where the tracks used to be in this big long you know uh, furrow of land. Uh, mm-hmm. We were able to actually find a few of few really rusty old. Uh, railroad spikes, which were great souvenirs, so they're, they're in my collection right now. But I mean, you can go all the way across the country from even the, uh, the Aura Flame lights out in uh, 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 San Julian, California, to the Marfa lights out in Texas, which are very famous lights out there as well. Um, so they're literally anywhere, pretty much in your backyard, within a, at least a hundred miles or so. You probably find something like that. There's one down. In Georgia, which I want to go see one year, called the Screven Ghost Light, which is uh, uh, a little bit uh, west of uh, Atlanta. Uh, it's a very famous ghost light out there. There's one called the Hookerman Ghost Light. I mean, just just you know, really hundreds of lights that people have seen throughout the years. Some are active and some are are inactive right now. Um, but some are not. Or all of okay, you said you debunked one. Mm-hmm. So is it possible that some of these other lights could be swamp gas or something else, or oh, yeah. is it? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't actually investigated every single light that's in my book. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, we try to go. There was one in Kanka, uh, not too far from Watsika, Illinois, where the Watsika Wonder, the Rolf House, is, is we, we investigated a number of years ago. There's a ghost light down there, um, and and even the more famous one around here, the Moody Light. Uh, in Rensselaer, Indiana, where people say it's Farmer Moody, uh, you know, trying to find his uh, kidnapped girls that were out there, either kidnapped by the Indians or by a local uh, uh, maniac, and they, they see the light down the trail. Now, that light I, I was able to, to debunk out there with a good friend of mine named Gary Hart. Uh, went out there, and we literally went and had high-powered binoculars, and those lights that we, we were seeing coming down the road diffused very nicely into two headlight beams. So, you know, that is the most often repeated um, explanation for these lights is reflections or car headlights or tail lights. But then you have that swamp gas. But that swamp gas phenomena is really a kind of a rare phenomenon. It's, it's basically phosgene. It's, it's like it's a, it's, a, it's a light given off by decaying wood. Uh, and it's kind of a glow. It's, it's kind of a dull glow. This, these lights that people often see are very pinpoints of light. Uh, they're very bright. Uh, they get very close. They get very far away. They seem to move. They seem to display intelligence, at least the ones I've examined. Now, there are probably quite a number uh, that fall into that category where it's more natural than supernatural. Right. Yeah. Like I said, I, I I think it would be interesting to see um, because because I've never seen them. Um, but, but we do have a question from you from Wendy Schindler. She asks, where was your very first official investigation? Um, my very first official investigation probably was in Bachelors Grove Cemetery. Uh, which is a cemetery here in the southwest side of the city in near Midlothian, uh, probably back around 1973, 74. Um, actually, even before I became more, you know, I always like to kind of give the benchmark as 1975 is where I became more serious ghost research. But I, my interest goes all the way back to childhood. Uh, my parents telling me ghost stories when I was a youngster. That's probably what kind of gave me the incentive to kind of look look into these stories that my parents and grandparents told me, including a very famous ghost out here uh, called Resurrection Mary, uh, uh, hitchhiking ghost stories. So probably that was most likely the very first uh, place I investigated. I uh, began shooting a lot of infrared film. Uh, with a 35 millimeter camera coming up with quite, quite some, uh, some interesting results that you can actually see on my website. Um, we did a few homes in the Oak Park, um, Berwyn area of, the t- of, of town uh, with um, fellow investigator Martin B. Ricardo, who uh, me and him co-founded uh, what was originally called the Ghost Trackers Club back in 19... Uh, 
77 and was re- re- later na- uh, named the Ghost Research Society in 1982. So we did a number of these private homes that we went into uh, where, again, back in the 70s, I really had no equipment. I mean, my equipment arsenal was a 35 millimeter camera, a cassette tape recorder, and my EMF meter was a compass. Mm-hmm. So that shows you basically back, they didn't even have a K2 meter back then or a cell sensor or anything. Uh, and then, of course, later on, you had to take equipment that had other uses to find high EMF readings inside homes that could be dangerous uh, to yourself. And we kind of adapted those to picking up other possible energies. And now, of course, the, the best of all the, uh, the uh, best of both worlds is now you have people that specifically design equipment just for the purpose of ghost research, which is really uh, mildly refreshing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you find that they repurpose other equipment for, for ghost hunting. I've been seeing that recently. Um, I, I know you probably used the old cassette player for your EVPs back then. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, I still think that's a really good way to get them. You can still get cassette players and cassettes at Walmart. You know, they're a little bit more than you want to pay, but mm-hmm. you can still get them. Uh, I, I, I still actually have two open reel tape recorders, reel to reel tape recorders. And that's, if you if you go back to the history of EVPs, that's how the original people recorded EVPs using open reel tape recorders. Uh, Philip, Philip Jurgensen, who was a... Uh, more or less a botanist was out in the middle of a field trying to record bird songs. And when he played back these songs of birds, he figured in the middle of nowhere, he was the only person there. He was hearing voices of people out there. So he accidentally discovered what we later called electronic voice phenomena. And then you had people like Constantine Radeve, Professor Hans Bender from Freeburg University, and other people, Sarah Estep. Uh, who I met and worked with a number of times in Baltimore, Severna Park, Maryland. Hey, I all used to people, live there. All these people used open reel tape recorders, and that was the way to capture them back then because it's magnetic recording tape. And if we believe that spirits are some form of energy, whether it be electromagnetic or electric or magnetic or something in between, these tapes are a, a magnetic recording tape. So the theory a lot of people had is that The reason you don't hear the EVPs as you're recording them is that the spirits are literally bypassing the physical microphone and imprinting these directly on the magnetic recording tape. And then when you play them back, that's when you hear them. Wow. Do do you think so? So you think a reel to reel is probably the best and then the next would be a cassette player and then third would be digital? Uh, yeah, uh, well, digital basically it would be what people use today, uh, and you, people do still get quite a bit of you know, EVPs on on digital recorders. But uh, if you go back to the old analog stuff before everything became digital, that's where you. I even use old analog televisions, little tiny TVs that you can pick up at a at a flea market or at a, at a thrift store. These TVs are not digital. They're analog. Right. They will, mm-hmm. and because now we're in the digital age, these TVs will not pick up any signal at all. It's impossible because they're not digital. Right. I, I, so why use these for ITC experiments? Right, because they're. I mean, because now if you have, you don't get fuzz right. on the TV like we used to. We don't. They don't do test patterns. It just goes blue in most cases. It exactly. says no signal. Um, but you know that's. That's some of the things that people need to learn. It is harder to do TV ITC than it was back in the days where we all had these big Sony TVs sitting in the middle of our living room that weighed 600 pounds. <laughs> yeah. With the big, yeah, t- I mean, with the big tubes and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had a couple, you know, I mean, I'm grateful that we got these smaller TVs that we can do stuff with. Um, 
But and I I still and somebody says they still have a few uh, battery operated TVs. So do we. We have a little one inch screen one somewhere here in the house. But everybody, you're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. We will be back after the news break with Dale Kazmarek. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. In South Carolina, several Democratic presidential candidates spent part of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday with voters, attending a prayer breakfast, church service, and rally. The state's first in the South Democratic primary is in 40 days. Delisha Eady from South Carolina Public Radio reports many voters are still undecided. Seven of the 12 candidates walked arm in arm, leading a march to the state's capital. Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Tom Steyer, Elizabeth Warren, Tulsi Gabbard, Amy Klobuchar, and Deval Patrick praised Dr. King for his work and sacrifice and urged voters to continue his legacy by showing up at the polls. Pete Buttigieg joined the march but did not address the crowd. Candidates have made several trips to the state, but many voters, like mediator Cabrina Bass, say no one has yet won their vote. I'm undecided at this time, and the reason I'm undecided is because I'm struggling. I'm struggling real hard with the people that are the candidates. I don't see anything that represents my values or my views. South Carolina's Democratic primary is February 29th. For NPR News, I'm Felicia Eady in Columbia, South Carolina. In Virginia, thousands of gun right activists from around the country gathered at the state capitol in Richmond today, rallying peacefully to protest plans by the state's newly elected Democratic legislature to pass gun control legislation. Santiago Helmick is a gun rights supporter. To me, to keep the guns I have is to be able to protect myself from people like Governor Northam. Because, you know, he thinks he can come in here and just say whatever he wants to do, and that's not how it's going to work. He thinks everybody here is going to comply. I bet you nobody here is going to comply with any of the laws he's going to pass. Both the size of the rally and the expected attendance by white nationalists and fringe militia groups raised security fears, but those fears of violence never materialized. Rally goers spilled into the streets chanting USA and waving signs denouncing the governor who temporarily banned weapons for the Capitol complex during that rally. Workers for the U.S. Census Bureau are gathering in a small fishing village in Alaska to officially launch the 2020 census on Tuesday. As NPR's Hans- Hansi Lo Wong reports, the national headcount starts in a remote part of Alaska this week before rolling out to the rest of the U.S. in March. Census Bureau workers have been arriving by bush plane to Tuxuk Bay, a village along the southwestern edge of Alaska. Had a good time in Tuxuk Bay. How are you, my friend? Since 1960, the federal government has started the constitutionally mandated count in remote parts of Alaska in January. That's when the ground is frozen enough for census workers to visit far-flung communities by snow machines and dog sleds. The Census Bureau's director is set to personally do the first 2020 census interview with Lizzie Chamuwak, an aunt of Tuxuk Bay resident Alexi Jimmy. She's going to be the first one in the United States, and we're all excited about it. The Bureau is set to start releasing census results by the end of the year. Hansi Luong, NPR News, Tuxuk Bay, Alaska. This is NPR News from Washington. Public transportation in Paris is returning to near normal today after more than six weeks of disruptions and cancellations. A major union has called off its workers' strike. And here's Eleanor Beardsley reports France's longest labor walkout was spurred by President Emmanuel Macron's retirement overhaul. The union representing Paris transport workers announced it was suspending its strike 46 days after it first began. Last week, the French government dropped the most contentious part of the reform, raising the minimum retirement age from 62 to 64. With that, the country's so-called reformist unions said they could support the president's move to streamline the country's fragmented retirement system into one universal pension scheme. But the standoff is not completely over. Some commuter train drivers and dock workers affiliated with the hardline CGT union say they won't stand down until Macron with withdraws his whole plan. Eleanor Beardsley, NPR News, Paris. The battery replacements on the International Space Station are complete. Astronauts Jessica Meir and Christina Cook took a spacewalk today, installing the last battery in a set of six. That's a project that started last fall. NASA has gradually been replacing the space station's 
48 aging original nickel hydrogen batteries with the more powerful lithium ion batteries. This marked the women's third spacewalk together. Wall Street was closed today in observance of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. It reopens tomorrow morning at 9.30. I'm Janine Herbst, NPR News in Washington. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore. My guest tonight is Dale Kazmierich, and we are going to ask... Uh, the questions that we have, and then we're going to get into some other topics that uh, both Kat, I, and Dale all find very important to discuss. So Wendy asks, um, what was your favorite investigation and why? Mm. Well, uh, I guess that's really kind of hard to say. I've investigated almost 4,100 places in 45 years um i guess if i had to to put draw one out of the air i think the one that would probably make the most sense for me would be trans allegheny lunatic asylum in western west virginia it's a 256,000 square foot building uh it's the second largest brick mason structure in the world next to the kremlin it gives you an idea of the size um, we were there and, um, we were part of a, a public investigation, but, you know, they divided the groups into smaller groups of about 12 people. So that was great. And 12 people on, on each floor, you, it's literally, you, you get swallowed up by the, the immensity of the place. Uh, we went to one area on the, um, on one of the floors where, they tell the story of a of a, a female p- inmate or patient. Actually, it wasn't an inmate. I guess you call them patients. Named Ruth, which happens to be my wife's name too, which is kind of coincidental. But my wife, my, my wife's not crazy, by the way. And uh, <laughs> well, so, you know, she may be. I mean, yeah. she married a ghost hunter. There you go. So they tell the story about how Ruth would often interact with people of the opposite sex, uh, doctors, orderlies, patients, visitors. She would throw food at their shot obscenities, throw her TV trays, anything she had in her hand. She just didn't like males for some reason. So, and this is a true story. I was able to actually document this. This has been told several times. We've been there three times and it's always told the same way. So I'm assuming it's, we got different guys. So, and I was able to do my own independent research and verify this. So we went to the area where Ruth is said to have been housed. And just down the hall are these isolation cells where they put unruly patients. Uh, So we were over there and I was there with three other female investigators. So that's interesting. I was the only male investigator there that evening uh, that for this AVP session. And, if you go to my website, go to Trans Allegheny, the very first Trans Allegheny investigation, you'll actually see the video of this. Uh, we had a night shot camera set up on a tripod. We had some mal meters. We had REM pods. We had all different things set up. We were doing an EVP session. And all of a sudden, my whole arm literally fell asleep. It got all tingly, ice cold, like I just put into a deep freeze. The hair was standing up on my on my arms. People had taken pictures of that to show. It was like a static charge I felt in the air. And then you all of a sudden see me grab my butt cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Something literally grabbed the hole, a cold, icy hand, I swear. It was a cold hand that grabbed the hold of it, and you just see me, my hand go down there and go, whoa! And I wasn't scared. I said, like, bring it on. Bring on some more because it's what I live for. The three other females, however, you hear them saying, I'm not feeling a draft. I'm not feeling a cold. I'm not feeling anything. Well, why? Because they're females. So we continue with our EVP session, and we were using an obelisk in phonetic mode. Now, in phonetic mode, is different than the dictionary mode where they use like 4,280 words in the dictionary The phonetic mode allows the spirits to form their own words, putting together vowels and consonants to create words and then string them into sentences. So I asked the question, 
after I got grabbed, uh, are you, do you want us to leave or do you want me to leave? One word came through, you. And that's also on the, the EVP. You can actually see that on the site. Uh, so we left because we felt at this time, at this point, we were kind of, you know, in, in, impeding her or getting in her in her space. I guess you the best way to say it. So we left and we went to a different area. So that's really is the one that kind of stands out. That first time we went there, we were literally being directed through. The, you know, there was like twelve people in our group. I was videotaping the entire thing from start to finish. As our guy took us through, walked through, you know, and telling us the stories, I heard and our group heard and we recorded no less than nine disembodied screams coming down the hallway. And you can hear those on the EVPs and on the actual video. There's actually a video you'll you'll see where you hear this scream and then this guy turns around that I don't even know. He goes, he kind of faces the camera. What was that? And you see the, the terror in this guy's face because obviously he probably wasn't a ghost hunter. He was there for a for a, for a thrill, a thrill seeker, as I like to call him. Mm-hmm. And they got a real thrill. So if you ever get a chance to investigate that place or even go there on a tour, that place is dynamite. It literally uh, disembodied voices, shadow figures. We were doing an EVP session on the f- top floor. There's a chair in the in this closet. I uh, forget the name of the spirit, but it's it's so-and-so's chair, and you're not supposed to sit in that chair. Well, we had one of our investigators from another group decided to test it, to sit down on it. So we sat down in it. I turned my obelisk on. You'll actually hear it say dictionary mode, phonetic mode, and then it says, you get right up. Right after. I didn't even ask the question. went into phonetic mode, and it comes three words, uh, three or four words comes, you get right up. I said, Bob, you hear what it said? It tells you to get out of the chair. <laughs> so, yeah, they, there was some really amazing stuff that we saw and experienced in Trans-Allegheny. And if you ever had a chance to go back there again, I won't hesitate to go back. We drove by there, and we went in, and it was during the day, and we realized it would be better to hit it at night because – it was $40 for a day tour and $75 to do a paranormal investigation that night. Right. Mm-hmm. But we were too, we were heading to my mom's and we never realized it was only three hours from my mother's. And so it's like, well, we can't stay because we said we'd be at, you know, in this area tonight, you know, at, down in Pikeville, Kentucky. So, um, but yeah, that's one of the places that we would like to go is Trans Allegheny. And I do have a question about spook lights. This is from Ron. He's my husband. He says, um, do the lights seem to go from the ground to the sky or from the sky to the ground? Um, most of the ones that I've, I've investigated and are in my books uh, tend to be ones that just basically stay in the ground on, on ground level pretty much. And maybe they're floating maybe a couple of feet above the ground. Um, I'll give you an example. We were investigating the Joplin spook light and um, the one, the one encounter I was telling you about where we saw this, this diamond shaped object with a hollow center. You could actually see trees and bushes through this. We were about uh, 300 yards away with high powered binoculars and three other people were with me. I said, what did you, what do you see? What do you see? And they all said the same thing before I even said what I saw. Well, when this thing went down behind the hill, it left behind twinkles of phosphorescent, like, like it was giving off, emitting some sort of charge in the air. Now, we kind of crept up the hill as slowly as we could with our lights off. There was nobody on this rural road in the middle of the night. And about 50 feet in, in front of us, this, this light emerges from the, behind the hill and it sits there almost like it's looking at us, goes down really slowly, leaves behind that phosphorescent kind of twinkling effect. We topped the hill in about 15 seconds, and we estimated the light that we saw was about two miles down the road. It had gotten from there to there just like that. So this light tended to be more of a ground-level light. It did kind of elevate a little bit. There was even reports of it interacting and, and kind of, going through cow pastures 
with the cows sitting in the pastures and kind of just cows just kind of look down at it. I, I met a guy that was a very interesting guy called Garland Middleton. They used to call him Spooky Middleton. And he has, <laughs> used to have a little tiny shop. If you go to my website, you can actually see his little spook light museum that he had there. It's gone. It's been gone for decades. He used to give people a, a peek through the binoculars for like a nickel. Here, give me a nickel. I'll let you look through my binoculars and my telescopes. And he had pictures and he had cold soda pops. And he was just a, a wealth of knowledge. He would tell all these different stories about how he saw the light. So I guess the long and short of it, the ones that I've always, always seen and seem to be talked about most often are lights that are pretty much – just they stay at ground level or just maybe a few feet above the ground. I mean, there are instances, there are four main scenarios in, in my research where spook lights most often appear long, narrow stretches of highway, railroad tracks, bodies of water, and in cemeteries. And those are the four, and there are other, but the, those are the main four where if you, you see a spook light, it's most likely going to be in one of those four locations. That, I mean, that makes sense. So, well, thank you for answering his question. Here is um, another question. It's from Mary Strickland. She's, she asks, what do you think shadow people are? Good question. Uh, a lot of people, uh, let me preface that by saying a lot of people always try to, through their research or through their answers, would always say, well, shadow people Shadow images, dark images are always negative, something demonic, something diabolical, something – it's just a, a negativity about it. Um, my personal opinion, and I've, I've actually seen my share of shadow peoples. I have probably seen about 20, 25 ghosts basically in 45 years. That just shows you that's the scarcity of a visual sighting, which is by far the least reported way to see it. But shadow people or shadow images are most prevalent in places like Waverly Hills, Trans-Allegheny. Trans-Allegheny, a great story. We were sitting in the middle of this floor, patient room on one side, a day room on the other side. I said, if there's anybody here in the patient's room, come across to the day room. There are friends and relatives waiting for you to talk with you. No sooner had said that, three other people, including me, saw a shadow run across the hall into the day room and disappear. Of course, the cameras are facing in the opposite direction, so we didn't capture it. But you, ca but you actually see the people facing in the direction jump up, run over there, and you see, you hear, oh, wow, oh, 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 all these different expressions. So I believe that shadow images are basically just the way person wishes to appear at any given time they don't always appear as a uh you know like a uh, a full-bodied apparition mm -hmm. or a semi-transparent form or a mist or a fog or a light or a streak or whatever they can appear as a shadow person and when, they, when i say shadow per people or shadow people shadow persons darker than dark not just the shadows that we cast on, on, on the ground, but darker than dark. It literally can obscure light. And those are the shadow images that very often, if you're using laser grids, will, will cause the laser grids to focus on or they'll break the beams or they'll go through motion-activated infrared, passive infrared motion detectors and set them off because they got some sort of mass. They block the light from time to time. Mm -hmm. I've had I've had shadow images actually go through both uh, infrared beams and, and motion detectors and block off uh, lights on uh, laser grids on several occasions. So I, I believe that shadow images are just not diabolical, de demonic, just people. That's the way they 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 appear in some cases. I've I've told people that when I've seen shadow people it was because they could not manifest completely and that was as far as it could go yeah mm -hmm. was was to this and when you said darker than dark every time i hear that it makes me think of my pike mansion because that's how henry enters the basement is darker than dark um 
you can't see your, I mean, and you know, in that basement, you can't see your hand in front of your face, right? but yet you can see this thing that's even darker than that go by you or, well, of course you can feel him go by you, but we're at our next break. So everyone, please go, go get a drink. Cause I know I'm going to need one because we're going to get into some more, more things when we come back with Dale Kazmierich. You're listening to WBHM digital broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capital Account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride, and I'm here tonight with Dale Kazmarek, and we are going to talk about some things not to do with your equipment and other things on a, on an investigation. Um, last week we had somebody mention um, about thumbing the digital recorder and how that can distort the sound that's coming through your recorder. And on the break, we were talking about that and I wanted Dale to talk about some of the things not to do you know or that irritate him that he sees <laughs> you know because we all have that. You know, when you're an experienced investigator, you see stuff and you go, you know, it's wrong. Why are they doing it? So what are some of the things that um, irritate you on on an investigation? Well, obviously, just using equipment wrong and not knowing how to use the equipment or what the equipment's supposed to pick up. Uh, a lot of people use cameras. A lot of people use voice recorders. Uh, most of what most of your evidence you're going to get is going to be audio. You will get some video, you will get some pictures, but I'm going to say 80% or more is going to be audio. So you want your audio to be as clear as possible. 
when I see investigators on TV or just generally speaking, you know, I might be in a public investigation and I see people walking around with their digital recorders, holding them in their hands. It makes me cringe because literally you're just by moving the digital recorder in your hand, you impart noise into that recorder that can make it sound like a voice, you know, a sound or something. Um, even just holding at the very tip and walking around, you're, it can create a wind. It can create a breeze or a wind that'll hit that microphone and it'll, it'll go like a. You'll mm -hmm. hear that, and you'll think it's it's a a growl. What's well, really not? You're moving it around. So I always tell people. If you're doing an EVP session, find a level place, put it down, and set it down and walk away from it. That mm -hmm. way you're not going to be touching it, moving it. Uh, don't put it on a table in front of you and then fiddle around with on the table, moving papers and writing. That's all going to be picked up by the digital recorder as well. It's got to be in an area that no other noise is associated with it. Um, that's number one that I, that's my biggest pet peeve uh, when I see people doing it. Now, another thing I, I, I tend to get really, I'll say aggravated about is when they use devices that I, I, I would kind of call them substandard EMF meters. If you're going to invest, if you really want to be, uh, get the best possible results and, know pretty much that what you're picking up is not caused by the environment, is not caused by the inside wiring of a home, then you use the Tri-Field Natural EM Meter. It's going to cost you maybe $170, $180, but it's going to be the best meter in the market. I mean, it's, if you can't afford that, then I would say go with a Mel meter. Uh, the Mel meters are multifunctional. They pick up temperature. They pick up uh, uh, EMF, and in some cases, they can be set to have shadow detection and also a geofoam, which picks up vibration as well. So it can be multifunctional. They're not quite as sensitive as an EMF meter, and I mean a tri-field meter, but the thing with those devices, as in anything, you got to remember that as you're moving the meter around with you, what you're doing is you're moving the meter through electromagnetic fields that are all around us. So that's why you're going to get spikes. That's why in somebody shows you got a spike of 75 and then it goes down to zero. Well, why do they do that? Because they're moving it through a field. Most often, the best way to use these devices is the very slow sweeping motion or put it down uh, and let it, uh, you know, let it sense what's around it to begin with, acclimate itself to the EMF fields around us. And then if something goes through, then you're, what you're picking up is more like more, more tends to be more of a moving EMF field because you got a stationary, stationary meter and the thing may be spiked and went off. Very good example of this. Go to my website, check out the, uh, Mansfield Reformatory, Old Halsey Reformatory. I am holding a tri-field meter in my with my elbow locked and the video camera monitoring it. So the the motion you're seeing is the video camera moving, not the, my, my other arm moving with the tri-field. And that tri-field is literally burying the needle because it's picking up something, uh, which is really really kind of amazing because those devices don't normally alert. That's why a lot of these paranormal shows don't use that because they like to have other devices that light up all the time. Mm -hmm. And and that's not very scientific. Yeah. Uh, so uh, even some of the early episodes of, I won't even mention the shows, but the early episodes of some of these paranormal uh, shows, they would use these devices called uh, infrared non-contact thermometer guns. Mm -hmm. where you, you kind of you know, point and shoot. Point shoot, and the, everybody's saying, well, you're picking up cold spots in the air. Well, no, you're not. It's a contact reading. What you're doing is you're shooting a beam of light. It's contacting a surface, whether it be a floor, a ceiling, a door, a window, and then it's coming back at the speed of light, 
186,000 miles a second, which you get an instantaneous reading, and you're not going to pick up a cold spot. Now, if you don't believe me, go outside on a cold, cold day and point that meter out anywhere. Hit the snowbank, hit a house. It's going to be very, very, very cold. And then just wave your hand in front of it. Well, your hand is going to be contact reading that that thing is going to pick up and it's going to go probably about 96 degrees, which is a, uh, normally a surface reading of somebody's flesh. Mm-hmm. You're not going to pick up the air in between because if you could put your hand, if you keep your hand there, there, there's cold air between your hand and the meter, but you're not picking up the air. You're going to pick up your hand reading. Right, perfect, right. perfect, perfect way to test those meters. So, and I, and I, I remember doing an investigation at a place called, um, um, it was in Zion, Illinois, Illinois Beach Resort. And there was a bunch of rookies that were going to take off with another group. And they wanted me to get up and talk about equipment real quick. And I said, I see a lot of you have these guns. You can't really use these for picking up cold spots, I hope you know. And I went through the whole spiel. And then later on in the evening, Boy, look at that! Look at that cold spot, <laughs> and they're doing it just after I told them not to do it. So you get that mindset, mm-hmm. and you really have to figure out. I guess you got to prove it to yourself that these are the, these things are not the way they're designed. Uh, another thing that you got to be very careful of is using bell meters. Uh, you, you might have seen some of these bell meters that have a telescoping probe. Mm-hmm. That pulled out. It's same thing as a REM pod. Uh, it 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 creates a magnetic field around that probe. So if something comes close enough to that field, either ourselves or a spirit, the lights will light up. The sound will alert, and it'll tell you that something's breaking the field. Well, those you got to be very careful because either one of those devices, a REM pod or a millimeter, with that probe, can be set off by two things fluorescent lights, and two-way radios. Mm-hmm. And that's how these paranormal shows get these millimeters to uh, get these uh, REM pods to interact. When you say, is there a ghost? Say yes or no. And the thing lights up immediately. All you got is a person off stage, keying in a walkie-talkie, and the darn thing lights up. We saw that <laughs> firsthand at the Sally House because they would put a REM pod in the nursery and have the kitchen lights on downstairs. Well, the kitchen lights are fluorescent. Mm -hmm. And so it would, it would do that. And we, we would get, when we would give people the tours, when they were staying overnight, we would tell them if you need EMF created, here's a good place to do it is in this closet in the master bedroom, because there's old unshielded wiring in those walls. So it would create its own EMF. Yeah. BX cables. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But in the nursery, it would, you know, the fluorescent lights would make all your equipment go off. I don't know how many times I would tell them and they, and then later on you see a video going, look, we got this. And it's like, okay, come on people. You know, I just told you this because, I mean, I can tell you every place that you're going to get a false positive in the Sally house, you know, and we had people that would tell me, hey, we're getting EVPs. Well, it was the person upstairs because it feeds down to the basement or somebody in the basement and it feeds upstairs, you right. know. So I I am very skeptical of almost anything anybody gets in the Sally house if I don't know where everybody was. You know, <laughs> because yeah. I know, because I, I mean, I've had people bring me things and go, listen, it says get out. Well, it was the, you know, the neighbors, the neighbors were yelling at the dog next door. Yeah. You know, and, and you can, the houses are that close together. Um, but well, it's just. That, that's the biggest thing with, with EVPs, not to interrupt you, but the biggest but, thing I, with EVPs is, you know, my forte has always been photography. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I, for the last 30 years, I told people, and started this 30 years ago, if you got a picture you want me to look at, send it to my website, look at the, the, what I need as far as, you know, you know, kind of camera, what kind of film, you, you know, circumstances, where you were at, why you were taking the picture. Give me some background, and I'll give you my opinion. It may not be the opinion you want to hear, but you're asking for my opinion, so don't, so don't get mad if I say that it's not a ghost. But, you know, 
this, with the whole the whole idea of of people taking pictures uh, and, and and getting something unusual in a picture doesn't necessarily mean that it that's that's what it is because there's so many different things that can cause to show up in pictures as well as as EVPs. And when people send me EVPs for analysis, I say, yeah, I hear what you're telling me. I, I hear what I hear the get out or whatever it's going to be. But I don't know the circumstances behind how that EVP was captured. Was there people talking in the other room? Was it like you said, the neighbor yelling at their dog? Was there some other, you know, natural voice that came through, a human voice that came through, or somebody just not, you know, recording, holding the recorder or whatever? I don't know the circumstances. So I'm very skeptical about EVPs because not that I, I know darn well you can pick up EVPs. I got hundreds of them. But the thing is, when somebody sends me them, especially if people that are not necessarily, um, well, they're more novice than they are professional, it always, I always wonder the circumstances behind that event and what they may have picked up instead of. Hmm. Yeah, it always makes me wonder on a lot of that stuff. So, um, have you wit? You know, you've witnessed a lot of these. You know, do and don't do type things. What is one of the things you you would tell people? Hey, this would be a really good good thing to do during an investigation that always works for you. Role playing. Uh, going in there, and um, if you're in a hospital, for instance, uh, we, we went to uh, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital four or five times. We got phenomenal results in doing role playing, going into an operating room, having somebody lay down on an operating table, have other people actually uh, come in with, sh- with smocks or in, in scrubs, like they're actually in an operating uh, procedure, and then go through the whole procedure and see what kind of stuff that you get. You might be in a jail. You, you could be a prison prisoner or you could be a prison guard. Uh, come in with a pair of handcuffs, maybe with a billy club, uh, you know, a, a tin cup going across the bars, things that prisoners might have done. Just do stuff like that, and you'll be, you'll be amazed the amount of stuff that, we, that you got. We were doing, a, uh, doing a, a, a recreation. You can actually see this on our website in Old South Pittsburgh Hospital. We told the per- person that was lying down, Count backwards from 10. When you hit five, you're going to be out. So stop at five. So we go 10, 90, 7, 6, 5. Then you hear four, three. And somebody's, somebody's continuing to count down. And, but there's nobody talking. And then in the background, you hear, you hear harp monitors going off. And we all hear it. And where's that coming from? I and mean, it was actually a physical sensation. You actually got a disembodied noise that came out of nowhere because we were, you know, doing you know, a role-playing thing. We did the same role-playing event at Paris Hospital. We were there with an obelisk in phonetic mode. And one of the persons said, we need a doctor in here. Uh, this, this, this patient's dying. And, you know, Go to my website. It's the chillingest voice that ever came through. It's a deep voice that goes, he's dead. Hmm. So when you do role playing, um, well, no matter where you're at, try to find something and also try to maybe bring along trigger objects. Trigger objects are very, very useful. We go to Civil War. I got authentic Civil War bullets. I know they're authentic because they're sold not at the visitor center that they say replicas on it, but in the actual town of Gettysburg. Uh, you might get authentic Civil War money. You might get a musket, a part of a souvenir. I got actual buttons that were dug up out of the ground that I bought from, from, a, from an antique store. I paid you know, a pretty good penny for it. Great, great um, trigger objects. They were actually worn by somebody who was in the battle in, that, in Gettysburg or wherever you're at. Bring those mm-hmm. along. Play trigger music. Try to try to bring something along that uh, Civil War. You might bring, you know, Dixie or Battle Hymn of the Republic, or you know, whatever. Try to set the tone for where you're at, 
and I think you're going to get a lot better results. I bet you if you play the Gettysburg Address, yeah. that would be a wonderful trigger. Um, you know, that's one of the, you know. You, did you know that the furthest west Lincoln ever went was Atchison, Kansas? No, I didn't know that. Yep. He also went to Leavenworth, Kansas, which is south of there. But okay. that's still Leaven or Atchison is still further west. Okay. But as, as as far west as Lincoln ever went was hmm. Atchison. Okay. And I can even show you where. But <laughs> again, okay. I I did way too many tours there. Um, I also did the walking tour. That's how I found that one out. But um, it's just really interesting when you talk about trigger objects because you know and music because we did use. Um, sounds of battle at this house in Carthage, Missouri. Mm -hmm. It was during the Battle of Carthage um, at the Kendrick house down there. And one of the people with us decided to play, it was David Glidden, played gunshots and and all that. It was a battle. And we actually had one of our members that was with us that um, felt like he got shot. And Mm -hmm. he had to go outside to get away and it's like well that's kind of strange because the house was here you the shooting would have been outside but (laughs) but still he had to go outside to to get away and it was is odd when you think about that actually affecting a person um it's it's a very unusual um phenomena to occur um because that doesn't always happen you know a lot of people you know poo poo trigger objects no trigger Um, objects you're giving you're giving the ghost something that they can uh uh recognize relate relate to yeah or recognize something that was in their time frame it doesn't you know you wouldn't bring like a a a shiny new uh lincoln penny (laughs) to the civil war (laughs) because obviously they didn't have that they would have had maybe an indian said indian head penny or something like that uh, or maybe even beyond that, depending on member of right. my, uh So you bring something that is recognizable to them. I mean, I, I got a whole bag of trigger objects that I bring, whether it be handcuffs, uh, baby dolls, little balls, toy trucks, things for children. Uh, and I got you know other stuff like you know Civil War bullets and other. Depending where we're going, I always try to look up the area and see what you know what it. What would benefit the investigation to bring as a trigger object or as trigger music uh, to see um, maybe even old pictures of people? Uh, you, you can get, uh, I think they used to call them tin types or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I actually know a place where you can get those in, yeah. Le- in Leavenworth, Kansas. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's all kinds of those. But everybody, we've, this is our last break. So if you guys have any questions for Dale, Please put them in either of the chat rooms, and I will make sure I get them asked. So you're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. We'll be back with Dale Kazmarek in just a few minutes. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You're 
listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and my guest tonight is Dale Kazmarek. And here's one of the, we have a couple questions for you in the chat. This first one's from Tom McNicholas, and he sa- he asks, when is your next book releasing? <laughs> um, I wish I could say. Um, I used to publish my own books through what we call the Ghost Research Society Press. Uh, we have 19 titles that I published for not just myself, but other authors that wanted their books published. Um, I stopped publishing them years ago because the one I, I, I had some very expensive publishing software, Adobe Acrobat and other things on my one uh, computer that unfortunately the computer crashed the hard drive and I lost all my software. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was, it was it was very expensive to wanted to replace them. And the books just were not worth selling that much as they used to because think of it, how many bookstores are out there anymore? I mean, There's not very on, many. You get them on Amazon.com. Uh, you get them on a Kindle reader. So um, I don't know when my next book is, but I will say if it does come out, it's either going to be a Windy City Ghost 3 or most likely uh, I'm thinking of a book about my 40 years as a researcher, uh, how things changed since when I started to what it is and some of my most memorable experiences. That would be interesting, you know. Of course, me saying that doesn't mean that every that people would run out and buy it. But <laughs> right, I think right. it would be interesting because you figure what has changed in the last, you know, forty five years. Yeah. So yeah, it's funny. I can I I know. Like I said, nineteen seventy five was a it was a turning point for for me. It was a catalyst year. So. Calculating back to there right off the top of my head is pretty easy, <laughs> and yeah. it is a five. But, you know, I think about that all the time, that I've been having paranormal experiences for over 45 years. Mm-hmm. Technically, it's been 50 because, like I said, my first one was when I was four. But, you know, at four, you can say, oh, maybe. But at 10, you know. <laughs> See, that, you see, know for, a lot more. See, for me, I, I had a very uneventful childhood, so I didn't really have anything scary or paranormal. The, the scariest thing was my parents and grandparents telling me ghost stories when I was a youngster, and and feeding into that. Maybe I had a nightmare the night that that night, but the next night or two days later, I always wanted to hear another story. So that's just the kind of person I was. So you know, I didn't really have a paranormal event probably until I was maybe in my thirties. You know that I could say was paranormal, but uh, uh, since that time, when you get the ball rolling. You go to the, all these different places, and you the you know, getting better and better equipment, and you get better technologies, better better techniques, better methodologies. You know these things just kind of roll roll up. You know, like roll off your tongue real easy. That you're finding better EVPs, better experiences, disembodied voices, actual visualization. So. Um, it works. Uh, we have another question. This one's from Carl. He asks if you use dowsing rods. Uh, a couple of our people in our group do use dowsing rods. Um, I, uh, I'm i kind of up in the air about dowsing rods myself. I, I do know that um, uh, initially they were called uh, uh, like water witching or something. They used to find oil and water and other treasures underneath, and now uh, then people started to say, well, if you could find that, maybe you could find the energies created by a ghost, or even have the ghost communicate with you through the dowsing rods by uh, making go one way for yes and one way for no. Uh, if they weren't sure, they maybe would spin around or something like that. Um, my only problem with dowsing rods <clears throat> is that you'd have to really uh, ask so many questions, and you can really only ask a yes or a no question, uh, to get on the right track of what's, what's, what you're communicating with. And a lot of times, I won't say people do it purposely, but it's called, it's, it's just fatigue in your wrists. I mean, you're mm-hmm. supposed to be holding the dowsing rods like this, and eventually you, you, you start to get a little tired, and you might 
accidentally dip the rods unknowingly, and you might think mm-hmm. it swings back and forth. So I'm actually designing over the winter months. I've been looking into designing a, 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 uh, my own dowsing rods that mount on a on a block of wood with a level that shows you that you're perfectly level. Then you would touch the rods via uh, coils that would touch the rods, copper copper wires. You would have contact with the rods. You wouldn't have them in your hand, but you'd be on a level surface. And then if the rods cross back and forth, I think I'd be a little bit more uh, uh, prone to uh, believing that there's something with that. Now, I, some people in my group, you know, swear to the fact that they have communications, and I don't doubt it. But um, it's something that a skeptic might kind of, you know, yeah, you know, kind of poo-poo that idea because it's it's more it's, it's it's less scientific, I guess you might call it. Even though yeah. some people might be scientific. I'll tell you, I put dowsing rods in the ground, in you know, in the dirt yeah. one time at McPike mm-hmm. Mansion. Yeah. Nothing. Right. Okay. I wasn't touching them. I just put them in the ground, asked the questions. I don't know if you remember that, Ron. And then one time I actually put them in like a bottle at the Sally house trying to get them to, to go. Nothing. Nope. It wouldn't work. Um and it's the same so you're thing with the, the that, same thing with a Ouija board. If you if you got a Ouija board and you, somebody's moving it, maybe unconsciously comes consciously, but then you take your fingers off the planchette and you ask the questions, it doesn't move. And if it does move, then you're you're doing something <laughs> yeah. way too right or too yeah. wrong either way. Exactly. So, um, but you know, I have I my first dowsing rod experience was at McPike Mansion. I now have tons of sets of them, and I I love using them. But the thing is, is I know the answer before they do anything. Right. So it's like, why why even hold them? <laughs> yeah. You know, t- to me at this point, and that could be where your people are are at now with their dowsing rod experience, is that they know the answer before they ask it, but sure. or because the spirit tells them. But the we have a question from Wendy. She asks, would you share one of your grandparents' ghost stories with us? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of My grandmother, who was the only grandparent that I knew on my mother's side, everybody else had died before I was born. She always used to tell me in her very broken Polish and kind of broken English of a very f- famous ghost story <laughs> in, in Poland because my grandparents came from Poland. Um, and she, she told me this one story about this bridge and this is you know, the whole idea of bridges and so forth and uh the idea is that you'd come up to this bridge and there'd be a, a woman standing at the edge of the bridge and she would ask you whether you're male or female but most often it was a male that would approach the bridge and have this encounter and see this apparition she says for sir i can't get across the bridge would you carry me across the bridge and, of course, the gentleman, you know, picks her up, carries her across the bridge, sits her down, and she asks the question, like, where's the nearest town? He goes to point. He looks back. The woman's gone in an instant, just gone. And that kind of goes back to that whole idea, if you remember the stories of the headless horseman and Ichabod Crane, uh, that the ghost can't cross running water. And there's a running stream underneath that. So they say if you picked up the ghost and crossed the water with the ghost, that would be okay. Then on the other side, it would disappear. So that I remember that story just like it was told to me yesterday. And maybe she told it a little bit scarier than, than I'm telling it. But uh, I remember as a s- six or seven-year-old, it was pretty scary. <laughs> I bet. You know, because I know that I never got any ghost stories from my family. Um, all I got was things like, I mean, I did get the Greenbrier ghost story, but that was because my mom lived in the area. And so for her, that was a huge deal to tell people, Hey, this ghost put this guy in jail. Um, that was the very first ghost story I ever heard. And it was factual. So it's like kind of weird before we go, because we're coming to the end of the show, where are you going to be this year? Mm. Any planned events? Well, I know that I do have an interview on this Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, 10 p.m. Central Time on uh, Rob McConnell's X Zone, a uh, very famous uh, uh, radio station. Go, go to XZoneRadio.com and you can listen to it live streaming on your on your computer. 
Uh, as far as uh, locations this year, uh, like I said, we're, we're, we're shooting to go back to Gettysburg for sure. Uh, we want to make a trip to the Deep South to go to Brushy Mountain, uh, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, and uh, finish up with uh, uh, Stones River Battlefield. I hope to be able to get to uh, um, uh, Pennhurst this year as well. And then we got some places that we're looking into in Ohio, uh, including the, um, uh, the Old Bell Nursing Home. Uh, in Kimbolton, Ohio, uh, that I've wanted to investigate for years. Um, and, uh, you know, we got a list of about a, at least about a dozen places that we're looking at. I know, I know we probably ain't going to be able to investigate all these out-of-state locations because of the cost. And it's mostly the cost of staying at a hotel and the travel and the meals and everything. Usually these places aren't that expensive to get into. But uh, Penhurst is a place I've always wanted to go ever since I saw it on Ghost Adventures, because it just fascinated me. This place was just so huge. And uh, they had these underground tunnels, which they've now opened up, that you can actually go into before they had a lot of black mold and asbestos they had to clean up inside of there. They opened up three buildings, including the Quaker building and the Mayflower building. And uh, so we're hoping, if we can at least do uh, an investigation that maybe on the way back from Gettysburg that we can stop in and take a walking tour of the place because I think it would be just amazing. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I know that there, those are a lot of, of good places. Is there any events you're going to be at this year, paranormal conferences or anything like that? Um, I haven't been invited to anything yet. So if anybody's out there and looking for a speaker, I'm always looking to, uh, to talk. But I, 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 I am looking to – I did apply to do a, a one out in Winchester, Indiana in August. I forget the name of the conference. Uh, somebody has sent me an invite, and I just filled out an application uh, for that. Uh, I think last year uh, they were doing a paranormal event, um, uh, a paranormal conference at Pennhurst. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to go to, and I applied for that and never heard back from them. And, uh, of course, one place I've been dying to get down to is uh, Sloss Furnace down in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, they had they had an event there, I believe, uh, a couple of years ago, as well as an uh, uh, after-hours uh, investigation of the build, of this whole complex, which is just a, an yes. immense place. Kat, Kat and I met up there a few years ago. And did a walkthrough with her and Frank. So we know all about Sloss and <laughs> Kat knows everything there is to know about Sloss. I nice. guarantee it. So if you have any questions after the show, she'd be a good one to ask. Right. But uh, there's some history going on there for sure. Um, and it's very interesting. It's, just don't go in the summertime when it's 100 degrees. Yeah. Uh, not a yeah. lot of the places to get cool, really. But um but if you go after, if you go to Gettysburg or up to Gatlinburg afterwards, it won't matter because that's what we did. <laughs> yeah. It ended up being like 60 degrees and, you know, it was a hundred and something when we left Sloss and it was 60 degrees by the time we got to Gatlinburg. Wow. In July. Yeah. Mm. So, huh. yeah, that's not good for you. I mean, you're not even prepared for 60. But, yeah, there's all kinds of uh, fun things to do around Birmingham that we're, we've been uh, – thinking about checking out there's a lot of graveyards there that are really good i hear so um we wanted to get over to uh south carolina one year to go over to uh atlanta savannah uh mm. especially down over to um, uh the uh, civil war prison down there at andersonville i think think that would be a great place to do uh, some experiments out there with so many uh uh union soldiers that were uh, uh basically starved to death out there Oh yeah, there's like I said, there's a whole ton of places in the area that I want to want to check out. But usually we're driving through to go look, go do something. So we got to figure out a way to get down there and spend more actual time. Yeah. So um, everybody, I would like like you guys to huh? Oh, Ron, my husband just mentioned Sailors Creek. That's one of that's on his bucket list. Oh yeah. Have you been there I've in been Virginia? To, I I've been to almost every Civil War battlefield in the eastern uh, section of the country, almost every single one, except uh, for um, the uh, Fort Sumter. Mm. That's... I've, been, I, I've been to Sailor's Creek, yeah. Yeah, that's my husband's bucket list place. So, everybody, I want to thank 
want to let you guys know I'm so grateful for Dale coming on. I think that he did a great job, and um, and everybody seems to have liked listening to you tonight. So thank you so much. Join us next week when my guest is uh, Karen Lavin. She wrote some books about haunted, I think it's haunted Cincinnati. So it'll be interesting to talk to her. Um, somebody I didn't find on Facebook, so that'll be a little bit different for me. Um, and, she, and then the week after that, let's see, who do I have? I have some really interesting guests coming up for you guys. Um, on February 3rd, I have James McDaniel coming on. And then I th- and after that, I have David and David Glidden and uh, Dan Williams coming back on to talk about paranormal studies and the para concert in Joplin, Missouri. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun things to talk about in the next three weeks. And uh, hope everybody had a good time tonight. So you're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you so much, Dale, for coming on. And we'll My talk pleasure. to all of you next week. Thank you. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Warning. The following message does not necessarily reflect the views of WBHMDB or its hosts, guests listeners, or of any functioning adult in general. In fact, Frank should probably seek professional help. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, Frank Lee here. I thought that I would spend a few moments telling you about the positivity from the network here. Uh, The overall message of para-unity and happiness and how everyone here wants to get along with everyone out there and how everything is just wonderful wait cat's not looking (laughs) okay i've got something to really tell you okay so i'm going to tell you what's really going on Honestly, all that being nice and positive crap was kind of hurting my soul, as dark as it is. So, what's really happening? Well, you see it all the time. Everybody and their brother out there has a paranormal team because they watch a couple of episodes of Ghost Hunters or some crap like that. So they go and they spend half their mortgage payment on tools and things that light up that they don't understand. And then the next logical step after buying matching black t-shirts and posing like 90s rappers for their Facebook page is to, of course, have their own podcast. Well, you know what? You're not going to find that crap here. What we have here at WBHM Digital Broadcasting is the best host, the best guest, bringing you real information. All of the hosts here on this network know their stuff. They are the people who have been out there doing the work, doing actual research. And no, by research, I don't mean binge watching some kind of cheesy TV show on Netflix. I mean reading books. I mean out in the field doing the labor. And who are they interviewing on their shows? They're bringing you the people they have learned from. They're bringing you the best in the field covering all kinds of topics from UFOs and aliens to Bigfoot to cryptozoology to ghosts to anything you can think of a bit strange and unexplained it is here and you're going to get the best information here so stay tuned to WBHM Digital Broadcasting don't go anywhere speaking of going somewhere I've got to go before my mic gets cut. We'll see you there on WBHM TV.